a preliminary question about the bizarre and shocking vices of the upper-class Romans. Last week, and indeed the week before, we spoke about a catalogue of horrors. You have the possibility that an emperor has withdrawn to an island, had the island fitted up as some kind of alfresco brothel, adorned here and there with pornographic statues and paintings, and spends much of his time molesting little boys and girls. And then you have the almost certain fact of an emperor who, although barking mad, commits incest in public with his sisters and commits the most horrid murders. The question must arise, what kind of moral environment is the Roman Empire in the first century AD? And let's go back to Tiberius. You can say these are libels put around in his later years or after his death to blacken his reputation because he upset the senatorial aristocracy. But let us suppose that I have a particular dislike of Tony Blair or Margaret Thatcher. And supposing I were to put out claims that Margaret Thatcher covered her nipples with gold leaf and had sex with the entire cabinet in 1982. And if I were to make equally outlandish claims about Tony Blair, not only would you fail to believe me, but you would probably think that I was a little funny in the head. You would regard me as utterly unreliable for anything else I ever said again. We do that because such things do not happen. Now, doubtless, some very bad things do happen, but that, no, not that. And yet, people were able with a straight face to accuse Tiberius of what we would regard as the most loathsome and unlikely crimes. So what does that tell you about the Romans themselves? You don't make these accusations unless there is some chance that people will take them as true. And if there's some chance that people will take them as true, then in some degree these things do happen. It may be that Tiberius didn't fit up Capri as an alfresco brothel, but it may be that other Romans did behave in a broadly similar way. And you see, there are stories about Romans who did behave in broadly similar ways. So what, what is going on with these people? Let's imagine that you are a teenage boy the child of rather wealthy parents and you're brought up in a house where there are 400 slaves and that means that everyone with whom you interact is a slave and not only are these people willing to do anything you ask them to do they will also specialize in suggesting things that you might want to do you will find yourself with absolutely zero restraint on any impulse. There may be certain things that you feel inclined to do in your teenage years, and then you look back and think, oh, I'm rather glad I didn't give way to that urge. I'm glad I didn't do that. I'm glad I didn't do that. And yet, these young men were surrounded by people who just needed the word, and they would lay it on, or they would be actively suggesting it in order to curry favour. And when you're brought up in that kind of morally corrupting environment, then if you find yourself in a position of supreme power in the state, if you find that you have the same authority over the freeborn wealthy members of society as everybody else has over household slaves, then you will behave with that lack of restraint. So here we are, the fourth session of this series on the early emperors. And today we'll talk about Claudius, whom I call here the first normal emperor. I'll say a little more about that in a moment, but let's begin by looking at this representation of the accession of Claudius. This is by Lawrence Alma Tadema, and I think it was exhibited in 1871. 
it follows the sources very closely. Let's go back to last week. Caligula has outraged, and worse than that, he has scared the whole of the senatorial aristocracy. These people, working with rather high levels in the Praetorian Guard, decide that Caligula has to go. And so in January 41 AD, they do indeed get rid of Caligula. They jump on him and they stab him to death. They just keep on and on stabbing. After this, they run off, they get hold of his wife and they kill her. They get hold of his baby daughter and they smash her brains out on some marble steps. They then hurry back to the Senate House and first of all they announce that the Republic is restored and then, not surprisingly, they start arguing about which of them should be the next Emperor. And in the meantime, Caligula is lying dead in his palace. The next day, on the 25th of January, I believe, you have members of the Praetorian Guard wandering through the Imperial Palace, not, I presume, looking for people to murder, but looking for things to steal, because the Imperial Palace, you can well imagine, is filled with some very precious things. While the soldiers are digging around, they notice a pair of slippered feet sticking out from underneath a curtain. They pull the curtain aside, and there is old Claudius, the emperor's uncle, hiding from them. He falls to his knees, begging them not to murder him. The soldiers realise, hold on, he's the only adult male survivor of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. They have a quick talk among themselves, and they grab hold of Claudius, lift him onto their shoulders, and acclaim him emperor. Claudius, although terrified by the whole proceedings, is not as stupid as many people thought he was. He offers them an immediate reward. I will give you £15,000 in modern money. I'll give you £15,000 each, which only encourages them in their belief that Claudius is indeed the rightful emperor. This comes to the attention of the Senate, still meeting, they send down to Claudius, saying, present yourselves before our august assembly, and we will consider your claims. Claudius's answer, and he's now ensconced in the Praetorian camp, is, no, what you do is you acclaim me as the new emperor, and then we'll talk. So it goes back and forth for a few days, but then the senators realise a, that they have zero military force. B, that they have zero public opinion on their side. They cave in and they declare the same state of emergency as they had declared 50 years earlier to legitimise the rule of Augustus and the same state of emergency as they declared to legitimise Tiberius and then Caligula. The state of emergency was declared and Claudius was invited to step into the breach as the first citizen of Rome. Therefore, Claudius becomes the emperor. This brings me back to that quotation marked adjective, normal. In what sense was Claudius the first normal emperor? What I think I mean by this is that Augustus was the emperor because he'd won the civil wars and he'd killed all his opponents, or his opponents had been removed in various other ways from the world. And there was still some state of emergency. There was an entirely credible reason to say we cannot afford to restore the Republic at this moment. Tiberius was the anointed heir of Augustus, and so he became the emperor. Caligula was, with whatever subsequent disappointment, believed to be the man who would bring in a golden age of peace and love. 
so he was acclaimed as emperor by everyone around. Claudius was different. Claudius had nothing particular in his favour. He was the only surviving adult male member of the imperial family, which is something, but he was not in the running for succession. He hadn't been nominated by Caligula. He had no particular claims based on his own displayed merits. No, Claudius became the emperor because he was acclaimed as the emperor by the army and he didn't bribe the army into this, he rewarded the army for having so acclaimed him. He was then accepted by the Senate. This is what makes him the first normal emperor. He is appointed by this process of dual acclamation. He is acclaimed by the soldiers and he is elected by the Senate. And this is what makes him the legitimate emperor. He was a somewhat unlikely choice, or he would have been a somewhat unlikely choice if there had been anybody else on offer. But by the end of things, he was the only person on offer. Here is a slide on his early life, born 1st of August 10 BC. And do have a look at the imperial family tree and keep looking at it because as I keep on saying it explains many things about the politics of the imperial house. He is a son of Drusus and Drusus is himself the younger son of the Empress Livia by her first husband so he's not a grandson of Augustus, he is a grandson of Augustus's wife. He's also a grandson of Mark Antony and the sister of Octavian. So he is related to Augustus, but he's not directly descended from Augustus. So he is a grandson of Mark Antony and he is a grandson of the sister of Augustus. He was plagued from an early time by various bodily ailments of a kind which have produced much medical speculation, but this medical speculation is without any conclusion. He had a limp, he had a stammer, he had various stomach complaints. That's all we can say about him. He also had a reputation acquired very early in life as a fool, and he appears to have lacked judgment, but although he lacked judgment, he didn't lack intelligence or learning. Livy, the great historian himself, was Claudius's tutor, and Claudius was inspired at a very early age to historical composition, his first attempted work was a history of the civil wars while Augustus was still alive. It seems that his ambition was to produce an entirely impartial account of the civil wars, not something that Augustus and his ministers would have welcomed and certainly not something they would have welcomed from a member of the imperial family because although Augustus was probably the least bad option on offer, it would be difficult to say that Augustus was the perfect option. He was persuaded not to continue with his history of the civil wars, but he did spend much of the rest of his life writing historical works, and some of them appear to have been of first-class importance. He wrote a complete history of the Etruscans, and in order to do so, he learned Etruscan. Quite unusual. He also uniquely decided to write a history of Carthage. The archives, the Carthaginian archives, had recently been discovered, or a large chunk of them, during the rebuilding of Carthage. Claudius learned Punic, and this is most unusual for an ancient historian, you just don't learn foreign languages in order to do this kind of primary research. When Herodotus wrote his history of the rise of Persia, 
Did he learn Persian? No, nope, there's not the slightest evidence that he did so. Did any Greek historian writing on Persian affairs learn Persian? No, but Claudius did. He learned first Etruscan and then Punic. Oh, and he wrote his histories in Greek. So do not write off Claudius as a fool. He was a highly intelligent and a highly learned man, though he seems to have lacked some political judgment. There is the imperial family tree. Study it, study it, study it, and even then expect to look away from it and ask yourself, so who was this man's second wife and in what way was he related to Augustus? And then you look back at it and follow the lines. It's not the easiest family tree to follow and to keep permanently in mind, but it is impossible to study military history without a book of maps, and it's impossible to understand the history of the governing institutions of the Roman Empire in the first century without a good knowledge of this family tree. So there it is. Claudius has become emperor, unexpectedly, and the first thing that Claudius achieves is a return to normality. Caligula has not just been a tyrant, Rome has had tyrants before, it's had Sulla, and of course more recently it's had Tiberius, who was, it seems with reasonable certainty, a tyrant of sorts towards the end. Rome has had tyrants, but Caligula is its first insane tyrant. What Claudius does is, from the very beginning, to re-establish normal service. One of his first acts is to grant a blanket amnesty. No one is punished for the conspiracy to murder Caligula, except those men who took part in the actual murders. Those are put to death. But those who were involved in the plot, they benefit from a general amnesty. Claudius also recalls all of the people exiled by Caligula, including Caligula's sisters. Agrippina, for example, is recalled. Those people who've lost property to Caligula enjoy a degree of restitution. Claudius in his first years, and Claudius throughout his reign, he acquires a reputation for temperate and wise rule. He is loved by the ordinary people and he is also loved by the army. The Senate despises him. The Senate despises him because they despise him because they rather fancy being in his shoes, I imagine, but they despise him and all of the plots against Claudius come from the senatorial aristocracy. But here is evidence for the great popularity that Claudius enjoyed. This right-hand blue box. By such conduct, he won so much love and devotion in a short time, that when it was reported that he had been waylaid and killed on a journey to Ostia, the people were horror-stricken and with dreadful execrations continued to assail the soldiers as traitors and the senate as murderers, until finally one or two men, and later several, were brought forward upon the rostra by the magistrates, and they assured the people that Claudius was safe and on his way to the city. There you are, a man of great popularity. His relations with the senate were always troubled. Claudius was paranoid. He would always insist on having visitors, particularly senatorial visitors, searched. He'd have strip searches of everyone who would visit him. If he visited somebody, if he visited a sick man, for example, he would always have the patient's room carefully examined for weapons and hidden men. And you would say this is a weakness of Claudius, this kind of paranoia. On the other hand, Caligula had been murdered by a plot among the senators, and there are a number of undoubtedly true senatorial plots against Claudius. It's very hard 
not to believe that the senators are out to get you, when every so often some of them are revealed as being out to get you. Apart from that, however, Claudius did try to regard the Senate with due respect. He was a conservative, like his uncle Tiberius. He believed that the institutions of the Republic should be preserved, and they should be respected, and they should also be useful parts of the Constitution within the limits assigned to them. The Senate was no longer to be the supreme body of the Roman state, but it had been raised by Augustus and then Tiberius to the supreme law-making and deliberative body of the Roman state. And Claudius, just like Tiberius, expected the Senate to discharge that function, to make laws for the empire. Although Claudius believed that the Senate and the traditional magistrates of the Roman state should exercise the functions assigned them by Augustus and Tiberius, it is Claudius who hurried forward the centralization of power in his own hands that had begun in the time of Augustus. Claudius seems to have organized the entire government of the empire into the hands of four ministers presiding over ministries of growing size. You have four freedmen of his, four of his freed slaves. Narcissus, who was the minister of correspondence, Pallas, the minister of finance, Callistus, the minister of justice, and Polybius, minister without portfolio. These are the titles I've assigned them, but those are their functions. Each of these men headed a growing body of freedmen and of free employees, generally non-elite officials to carry out the policies of the emperor. Although Claudius was often accused by the elite historians of having been a tool in the hands of his freedmen, if you look at his policies, and if you look at changes in policies after a particular freedman minister is replaced, you'll see that there is no particular change. There is every reason to believe that those ministers are efficient and loyal servants of the emperor, and that they are put in charge of the execution of policies which have been decided ultimately by the emperor. Claudius was not the only legal reformer in the early empire. Indeed, all of the emperors, unless they were particularly useless or insane, were responsible for a steady tendency towards the transformation of Roman law in a more humane direction. One of Claudius's more significant achievements was to continue the humanization of the condition of slaves. In the late Republic, a slave had been a piece of living, breathing property. A slave in the late Republic had fewer legal protections against abuse than dogs and cats have probably less than many wild animals have in our country. By the time of Claudius, there had been a series of often timid reforms. Claudius hurried these forward. One of the more shocking abuses of Roman slavery was that if a slave fell sick and the master considered, oh, it's not worth treating him, he'll die soon, it was possible for a master to take that sick slave and dump him or her on the island in the Tiber. And there, so exposed, the slaves would die, except that there were charitable people in Rome. And although we can focus on the horrors of Roman society and believe that this is a uniquely wicked state of civilization, but we must also consider that there were charitable people. But whatever the case, charitable people would then go across the island and feed these slaves and nurse them back to health. And then if a slave did recover his health, 
it was legally possible for the master to step in and say, ah, my slave, I'll have him back now, thank you very much. One of Claudius's laws said that if you abandoned a sick slave and the sick slave didn't die, then you could take the act of abandonment as an act of freeing the slave. An abandoned slave was automatically freed. He also made a law saying that if a master killed a slave in order to save on medical costs, the master could be charged with murder. Whether a master ever was charged with murder is another matter, but the emperor did at least make such a law. And so there is a movement in some degree towards humanization of the condition of slaves, and we must give Claudius credit for that. Then you have his public works. Many of these had been on the agenda for years, or in some cases for generations. The two aqueducts that he completed had both, I believe, been started in the time of Caligula. Equally, his road from Italy to the Rhine, that had been projected under Tiberius, and the canal from the Rhine to the North Sea, I believe that had been an idea floated in the time of Augustus. And in banking the Tiber to make it into an effective canal connecting Rome to the port of Ostia, that went back to Julius Caesar, who had considered it. Although Claudius didn't wake up any particular morning and say, I have an idea for building a new port on the coast. Although these plans had existed in proposal form for the better part of a century, it is in Claudius's reign that serious attention was made to realising these projects. And maybe the most important of these projects was the building of the new port at Ostia. And if you look at the plan on the slide, it is a vast undertaking that required a great deal of technological innovation. What you have is the digging of a great artificial harbour, the surrounding of this harbour with two moles and a lighthouse. In order to build those great arms stretching into the sea and in order to find the land on which to build the lighthouse in just the right place, it was necessary not just to throw vast amounts of rubble into the water, and that by itself wouldn't work. It was necessary to use concrete that set underwater. Nobody knew how to do this, but Claudius commissioned the relevant engineers, the experiments were made, a kind of concrete, or rather a concrete was developed that would react with seawater and set rather than simply dissolving. The, the concrete foundations of this port were so strong that quite often they are still there doing the job after 2,000 years. This was the biggest building project of the reign and it largely put an end to the periodic shortages and even famines that had plagued both Rome and Italy. After this, you had a large and a safe port for grain shipments. Then, of course, Claudius needed to make sure that the grain shipments would come. When we go on holiday to the Mediterranean, it's usually in sometime between June and September, you form the idea that the Mediterranean is a calm and temperate sea, which it is in the summer months, but outside those months it can be a very rough and treacherous sea. And the sailing season in ancient times usually ran from the end of April to the end of September. Outside those months you did not put to sea. Claudius set up a system of subsidies or state-financed insurance that encouraged private shipping companies to continue carrying grain from Alexandria to Ostia all year round. A great public work for Rome and for Italy. 
the conquest of Britain, and this of course is something that deeply affects us. Julius Caesar had come across in 55 BC, indeed Julius Caesar had come across and landed about three quarters of a mile from where I'm sitting at the moment. On a better day than today, I would normally walk down the seashore to the Julius Caesar Memorial and sit on that reading for a bit and then walk back. But although Julius Caesar is the first Roman who turned up here, and he did come back the following year, there was no long-term conquest of Britain. And this long-term conquest had been on the agenda ever since the time of Julius Caesar, ever since the conquest of Gaul. Here is a map of the empire and the pinky areas or the movish areas, whatever colour you want to call them, those are the areas that Claudius added to the empire. Thrace and Mauritania, those were already in the empire, but they were transformed from client kingdoms into regular provinces. It's the top left one. It's that great chunk of southern England that he added to the empire. The reason Britain had been on the agenda was not just that the Roman government believed in wider still and wider. It's there, so we must conquer it. It's, Britain was regarded as a wealthy territory to conquer, filled with useful materials, and I regret to say filled with slaves, filled with people who could be enslaved. But Britain was also a thorn in the empire's side. Even in the time of Claudius, even in the 50s AD, and this is about a century after the whole of Gaul had been conquered by Julius Caesar, there were still people in Gaul who regarded the Roman conquest with regret and wanted to reverse those victories of Julius Caesar. They would withdraw to Britain, which at the time was filled by people speaking the same Celtic languages as in Gaul. There was no particular ethnic or linguistic difference between Gaul and southern Britain. These people in Britain would then hatch plots against the empire. Every so often they would go across the channel and land and burn and carry out acts of resistance, one might call them nowadays, before sailing back to the safety of Britain. The Roman government thought that a direct conquest of Britain would stop all further trouble in the Gallic provinces. Quite rightly, I suppose, there's no point conquering northwestern Europe if you don't also have control of Britain. This is something that has been realised time and time again during the past 500 years. So Julius Caesar had made a few incursions. Augustus and Tiberius had thought about it but put it on the back burner. Caligula had made some kind of exploratory moves towards Britain but it was Claudius who conquered Britain. He did so partly because he needed military glory. He had little to recommend him in his early years of emperor, except that he was not an insane tyrant. He needed something a little more glamorous as his legitimization. So, in 43 AD, he sent one of his most trusted generals, Aulus Plautus, at the head of 40,000 men to sail across the Channel, to land at Richborough, to march inland, to win a great battle against the assembled Britons somewhere on the banks of the Medway. Then, when the British resistance had been scattered and forced to retreat into the West Country, Claudius was in Gaul waiting for news. At the right moment, he sailed across, again landing at Richborough, which is about five miles from Rum sitting. It's been replaced now by Sandwich. But he sailed across and he made his way down. He presided over the winning of a great victory 
over the Britons outside Colchester. He then staged a triumphant procession through Colchester together with, I believe, 35 elephants. And he took the surrender and the obedience of the British chieftains in Colchester. Then he went back to Rome and celebrated a great triumph. That is a formal triumphant procession through the streets of Rome. The custom was that at the end of this triumphal procession, the prisoners of war, particularly the chieftains or the conquered kings and princes of the enemy, who had been paraded through the streets in chains, would be taken off to the temple of Hercules and strangled. Claudius broke with convention in that he spared the British chieftains, chiefly Caractacus, and these men were allowed to live out the rest of their lives in houses outside Rome. That being said, Claudius didn't break the convention because at the end of the Macedonian Wars, I think King Perseus of Macedon was allowed to live out the rest of his life without being strangled, but it was a custom for the conquered chieftains to be strangled after the procession, whereas Claudius went out of his way to make sure that these men were spared. So, from our point of view, that was the most significant achievement of Claudius. He brought Britain into the Roman Empire, where it stayed for about the next 400 years. Here are some images of Claudius, and you can be reasonably sure that, although this may represent his face, these are probably not very accurate representations of Claudius on the whole, but this is how the emperors expected to be viewed by their subjects. The nude bronze of Claudius, one of the more bizarre representations if you look at the ancient accounts of his appearance, but the bronze nude representation is, I believe, from Herculaneum. The bronze representation of his face on the left with the enormous ears, that may have a touch more realism about it. But these are fairly standard examples of how the Roman emperors wanted to present themselves to their subjects, and of course of how their subjects wanted their emperors to appear even if they hardly ever did look like that. Living gods. Let's now come to his final years. Claudius was married four times, and he's said to have been easily dominated by women. Indeed, I think Gibbon says, and I don't think Gibbon says, I know that Gibbon says somewhere in chapter two of his history, of the first 13 emperors, only Claudius may be said to have been entirely correct in his tastes in love. Make of that what you will. Claudius is said to have been easily dominated by women. His third wife, Valeria Messalina, produced two children, Octavia and Britannicus. But, and here we come into the area of blackening propaganda, or potentially blackening propaganda. Messalina is said to have been a nymphomaniac with a possible tendency to madness. There are stories that she competed with several Roman prostitutes for who could sleep with a larger number of men in one evening. This, of course, led to all manner of salacious representations from the Renaissance onwards, and here are some of them. She appears, as I say in the slides, or rather she is said to have been a nymphomaniac. There is a great deal of testimony to this effect. You can make of that testimony what you like. In 48 AD, and this is something which has never been adequately explained, it is just narrated by the ancient historians, Claudius was off inspecting the works in Ostia. He was the emperor. There was no doubt that he was the emperor. 
and that he would remain the emperor for the rest of his life. But while Claudius was outside the city inspecting the progress of his works at Ostia, Messalina appears to have publicly divorced the emperor and married her lover Gaius Silius. This may have been the beginning of a senatorial coup against Claudius. As I said, the Senate never much liked him. Why didn't they like him? Because he was not really one of them. He had never been allowed to be a senator during the reign of Tiberius. And although Caligula enrolled him in the Senate, that was rather late in life. Also, Claudius was often rather unbecoming in his public appearances, and I'm sure that as he sat rolling and stammering and sometimes talking nonsense in the Senate, many people sat there thinking, you know, I really could do this better myself. Whatever the case, in 48 AD, his wife married somebody else in public, and this may have been the beginning of a senatorial coup against Claudius. It was not a very efficiently mounted coup because it was put down with immediate and entirely effective force. Claudius's freedmen ministers gathered together and they squashed the plot. They arrested Messalina, they arrested Silius, they arrested all of the other people known or believed to have been involved in the plot. And over the next few days, they had these people put to death. It seems that Claudius was not entirely in control of the response. He seems indeed to have been passive throughout the entire crisis. And from this, you might say that he was suffering some kind of early decay or perhaps he was so shocked at what he discovered about his wife, and he'd always thought that she was as much in love with him as he was with her. Perhaps he was so deeply shocked by what he discovered about his wife that he temporarily lost control of his faculties. Whatever the case, his freedmen ministers took control of the government at the highest level and they squashed the plot. They had several dozen men put to death on the spot, and they also went to Messalina and said, this is the end, dear. You've got to commit suicide. Messalina then refused, saying, I can't do it. I don't want to die. Please, I want to live. And so it was necessary for a soldier to cut her head off. We have this this little passage from Suetonius, chapter 38. After Messalina was by his own command put to death, he, that is Claudius, sat down in his dining room and inquired why his lady came not. Many of those he had condemned to death, he ordered the next day to be invited to his table and to game with him, and even sent messengers to reprimand them as drowsy and sluggish fellows. Again, this is written by a more or less hostile biographer, the better part of a century after these events. And you are welcome to say, I don't trust a word of this. This is all tittle-tattle, handed down over three generations. But it strikes me as entirely likely. Something was happening to Claudius in the second half of his reign. We now come to the last act in the play, Agrippina. And again, get your imperial family tree out. Agrippina is the great-granddaughter of Augustus, forgive me. She is the daughter of Germanicus, the sister of Caligula, and the niece of Claudius. There, yes, that is it. What is her importance? Her importance is that she is by now a widow. She's produced one child by her first husband, a boy called Nero. And for whatever reason, Claudius is 
on the lookout for a new wife. He's had Messalina put to death, and rather than just say, I've not been entirely lucky in my marriages, I will live out the rest of my life as a bachelor, he is now looking for a replacement, and some of his freedmen push forward Agrippina, saying, she will be your next wife. Even, however, by the somewhat relaxed standards of the Roman aristocracy, marrying your niece is, well, it's illegal, it's incest. It is necessary, first of all, for Agrippina to ingratiate herself with Claudius, which she does remarkably well. She was, by all accounts, a very good-looking woman. And then it's necessary to get the Senate to change the law to allow marriages between uncles and nieces. Of course, the moment Claudius decides that, yes, the law must be changed, of course the Senate will say, yes, indeed, what a good idea, let's vote on it now. Once Claudius has decided that he really would like to marry his niece Agrippina, there are no impediments. But of course, well, there's no course about it. Agrippina, like many other women in the imperial family, and I will talk, I'll give a whole session to the imperial women. Agrippina, like many other women in the imperial house, was power-obsessed monstrous. I think that's a reasonable description of her. First of all, she works to take over large areas of the administration of the empire, and then she pushes and pushes to make sure that her son, Nero, is given equal billing with Claudius's natural son, Britannicus, who is a few years younger, and that the boys are made joint heirs. Because Nero was older, the moment he's adopted by Claudius, Nero becomes the preferred heir. He is the elder of Claudius's sons now. And although Claudius does say that he would like both Nero and Britannicus to take over after his death, Remember that Nero is the grandson of Germanicus, who even after 30 odd years is regarded as not far off a god by the Roman people. But once Agrippina has got what she wants, once she's got her son Nero adopted, then Claudius himself is surplus requirements. And here in blue, is the relevant chapter from the biography by Suetonius. Agrippina killed him by poison, but where and by whom it was administered remains uncertain. Some write that it was given him as he was feasting with the priests in the capital by the eunuch Halotus, his taster. Others say by Agrippina at his own table in mushrooms, a dish of which he was very fond. The accounts of what ensued are likewise variable. Some relate that he instantly became speechless, was seized with pain throughout the night, and died about daybreak. Others, that the first he fell into a sound sleep, and afterwards, his food rising, he threw up the whole, but had another dose given him. Whether in water gruel, under pretense of refreshment after his exhaustion, or in an enema, as if designed to relieve his bowels, is also uncertain. What we do know is that Claudius dies, and it is very likely that he was poisoned by his wife Agrippina. What else we can say, and this comes into what I'll say about Nero, is that while Agrippina was getting everything ready for Nero to be acclaimed as the next emperor. She kept up the pretense for several days that Claudius was still alive, putting out little bulletins to the people. He's a bit poorly today. Oh no, he's perking up. Look, he's called for a whole troop of actors to cheer him up while he's getting better in bed. Oh dear, he's having a relapse. And all the while, working behind the scenes, 
with her lover Seneca, who is also Nero's tutor, to make sure that the necessary alliances are made so that when news is finally released that Claudius is dead, Nero will be the man acclaimed by the soldiers and elected by the Senate as the emperor. Whatever the case, that is the end of Claudius. He's dead, <coughs> murdered by his wife, and is followed by Nero, who, of course, is regarded as another of the great monsters of the first emperors. That's all I can say at the moment about Claudius. Next week, I don't want to talk about Nero. I will hold that over. Next week, I think it would be an entirely natural time for talking about the origins of Christianity and the peculiar circumstances of the Jewish regions of the eastern provinces in the empire. So that's all I can say at the moment about Claudius. Any questions? A question about the Praetorian Guard and how to join it. In the first instance, it was just a division of the army. They were stationed around Rome in the time of Augustus. In the time of Tiberius, they were gathered together into a camp just outside the city. They were there to keep order in Rome. They were there to protect the emperor, I suppose. It soon became one of those plum postings. You don't just join the army, you get into the Praetorian Guard. And it's a very fine thing to be a member of the Praetorian Guard because you don't have to go and freeze yourself to death on Hadrian's Wall or on the Rhine or the Danube. You don't have to go off and fight under a burning sun in the east against the Parthians or the Arabs. No, you just sit around in Rome eating and drinking and every so often murdering an emperor and taking bribes from whoever wants to be his successor. The Praetorian Guard, from about the death of Caligula until about the time of Diocletian, 300 years later, is one of the most important institutions in the Roman constitution because these are the people who, in normal circumstances, represent the army to acclaim the emperor and so they collect the largest bonuses. But you see, the Roman Empire was a military dictatorship. That's what it was at the beginning. The only time it stopped being a military dictatorship and became a more or less normal monarchy was towards the end of the third century when it became a divine right hereditary monarchy. Has everybody read I, Claudius by Robert Graves? It tends to colour all discussion of Claudius, doesn't it? Something Robert Graves plays down is the fact that Claudius was a rather bloodthirsty man. He loved watching the gladiatorial games and he loved watching the blood spurt and he would always insist that the loser should be killed. On one occasion, when there weren't any gladiators available, he insisted that the trainers and the managers of the amphitheatre themselves should fight to the death. He also enjoyed watching people tortured and put to death, so he's not quite the genial, good-natured hero that Robert Graves shows him to be. On the other hand, he wasn't quite the drooling, slobbering idiot Tacitus shows him to be. He was a wise and temperate ruler. He did many good things, and he did much to nurse Rome back to a sense of normality after the terrible shock of Caligula.